everybody. This is the Post Movie Podcast. I'm Steve Head. And I'm John Black. And on this week's episode, we're going to review the new 3D action flick, Drive Angry, and the new Farrelly Brothers film, Hall Pass, which we saw a few days back. But we just got out of the screening for Drive Angry. And, and we're both smiling. <laughs> we both have these stupid smiles on our faces. It's, it was so much fun. It's good. It's good. And then, and then we're going to get into our uh, picks of the week. Peter Yates, uh, director, passed away about a month or so ago, and the Brattles got a, uh, um, a tribute over, over a couple of days next week, so we're going to talk about a couple of his films. But let's get right into Drive Angry, <laughs> which was... Not, I, I'm amused because it's, it it's highly entertaining. It was highly entertaining, <laughs> I thought. Yeah, it was a blast. It was a blast. And um, it's, you know, it's almost, I don't know how much we want to tell people what it's about because it, it, it's not going to sound good. You know? Well, here, I'll get into the summary. Yeah. Um, all right, Summit says, In the newest 3D action adventure from the director of My Bloody Valentine, Drive Angry stars Nicolas Cage as Milton, a hardened felon who has broken out of hell for one last chance of redemption. Intent on stopping a vicious cult who murdered his daughter, he has three days to stop them before they sacrifice her baby beneath a full moon. He's joined by Piper, played by Amber Heard. The two of them are hot on the trail of the deadly leader of the cult, Jonah King, played by Billy Burke, who believes it's his destiny to use the baby to unleash hell on earth. But the bloodthirsty cult is the least of Milton's problems. The police are after him too, and worse, an enigmatic killer known as the Accountant, played by William Fitchner, yep. who has been sent by the devil to retrieve Milton and deliver him back to hell. With wicked cunning and hypnotic savagery, the accountant will ruthlessly pursue Milton at high speed across the, this country until his mission is accomplished. Now, how much of that did you know before you went in? The only thing I knew that it was that um, uh, Nicolas Cage had escaped from hell. I didn't even so know there was that. a super supernatural. Element. I didn't. I just thought it was Nicolas Cage in like you know, um, Drive Angry. You know, he. I, did, I just thought it was a stupid car movie. Well, they, no they idea really the didn't do. Angle. You know, Summit didn't put too much into, as far as I can tell, um, promoting the story of the film. Nothing. They they really put a lot into making sure everybody knows that it was filmed in 3D. Right. Right. Which so you know, I guess it looked great. Yeah. I mean, if, even if it wasn't in 3D, the the stuff would have. Uh, look just as good, but uh, you know, this is the man who directed uh, Bloody Valentine in 3D, Valentine. which was the first nudity I saw in 3D, and he, he's back with more nudity Dracula in 3D. 2000. Yeah, um, crazy, crazy action. Uh, you know, it was, you know, it, it, at the end, at the final, the final scene when when Nick is uh, driving back to hell, they play a meatloaf song. And to me, this is like me, this movie was like listening to Meatloaf. It's it's over Shouldn't the top. Shouldn't they have said bombastic. spoiler? Spoiler? No. He doesn't. Uh, I don't know spoiler. He, he doesn't drive back to hell. He dies. Yes, that's right. That's right. Um, well, just at the end of the movie, they play Meatloaf, and I was like, that's the perfect soundtrack for this movie. Besides all the other headbanging metal they play throughout the thing, every time someone starts up a car, you know, another metal song starts. But well, it's just so bombastic. It's so over the top. It is bombastic crazy. and over the top. It's a film that would work in a triple feature with Planet Terror and Death Proof. Mm -hmm. it, it could very well be in the Robert Rodriguez yeah, Quentin right Tarantino now. thing. Um, has has all of that sensibility. In fact, the characters in the films are just very archetypal, and it's the way they they go about doing this that has a terrific sense of humor about it. Um, you know, every, everything is heightened. Everybody's you know disregard for life. Everybody's you know all, all the, the waitress's you know problems in her life. Nicholas Cage is uh, just uh, cold blooded intensity. The uh, what I really liked was. Um, the uh, the accountant's cavalier attitude towards life, like everything was a joke, and it was actually really well written. There were some pretty funny things that uh, the accountant said. And he's, you see him sort of as the bad guy, and he's another one of these cavalier bad guys. But the accountant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we see the humor in his character, and it comes across across really. Enter it's it's entertainingly done. The yeah, movie, it's a great performance by um, who played the accountant again? William Fitcher. Yeah, he he was just perfect for that for that part. It's not a chop shop film. I mean, I was very impressed by how these scenes were edited and composed, and quite taken aback by a couple of the action sequences. Oh my God! I must say, uh, the um, again, not to spoil things, but there are a few. It's really bloody. 
Yes. 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 I didn't know, again, when I walked in, I didn't know if it was a PG-13 or an R until I heard the first two motherfuckers, and I was like, oh, this must be R. Right. And then, right. I was thinking the exact same thing, R, that they kick it in there. It's a hard R. It's, it's worth it, you know, because... When I see an action movie, I want when someone gets shot, I want to see blood. Yes, this, you this see is blood. um, you know, not. I guess also in the same vein as Kick Ass. I mean, it has over the top violence and a sense of humor about it, but it still it has that like, oh my god, this is really deplorable in you know many ways. Why am I laughing at this? <laughs> this is... it, it's it's astonishing. I mean, I think some of the things I was laughing at in the way that we were laughing at Piranha 3D was the absurdity of the activity we were seeing on the screen. Mm -hmm. Nick Cage kills five guys while he is in the midst of making love to a prostitute. Waitress. Waitress. Same thing, yeah. She looked the same. That was <laughs> and and um, just the idea that they... They use the 3D effects. Yes, a lot of stuff comes flying out at you, but they also use the 3D effect to show that's a bone coming out of the guy's knee, you know, <laughs> and it's, it's really up close, and that's a bone coming out of the guy's knee. Another re way this movie really works is um, Billy Burke's performance mm -hmm. as Jonah. What else do I know him well, from? Well, um, you know, I couldn't quite recall. I'm, I'm wondering if he was in True Blood, but I'm probably wrong. It ha he has that kind of look, dark menacing and he has a sense of humor about it too about you know being a bad about him being you know the yeah. guy who's going to unleash hell on earth yeah um also what his character does to us is quickly very quickly to establishing himself as really bad i mean really bad i mean in the first 60 seconds you see this guy on the film he's killed a couple of people slit their throats and is tasting their blood mm -hmm. his character uh, goes over the top, and also oh, yeah. Nick Cage um, proves himself in front of Amber Heard, so you know that you know he's got the that she's going to be you know that she's totally amazed by him. So right, right, she comes to he yeah. comes to her rescue. Yeah. Who is she, by the way? She looked you know, we've, fabulous. We've seen her in a couple she's of films gorgeous. this year, and you know what? I'm not recalling which ones they are. And you know the thing is, she plays a she plays a tough broad, tough southern broad, mm -hmm. and uh, she plays it well. She, the dialogue she, is pretty she raunchy. Could bring back, she could bring back Daisy Dukes. Yeah. You know, especially in 3D. Her choice of music when she's pulling, when she when she quits her job after her boss oh, yeah. dumped her. Blank uh, until the pain goes away. Right, right, from uh, Lost in Translation. It's and pretty, she's, uh, pretty funny. Yeah, the movie has a... Uh, just an over-the-top ambiance. I, I, thought, I thought it was really fun. It's not... You know, don't second guess it, Steve. I do. It was just I fun. do tend I to say that. I mean, because the, the artistry in this film is just not this. It's so far removed from um, you know other cinema aesthetics. It's its own sort of thing. Well, you know, it's you very remember? much. Best I can say is that you, you like Quentin Tarantino's and Robert Rodriguez's stuff. This is very much the same thing, and it's really well done. It is, but you know, when you mention the the um, the Grindhouse movies. Rodriguez and Tarantino were very self-conscious that they were making art. It was it was grindhouse art, but there was art. You know, they're artists. This this didn't have that kind of self-consciousness about it being art. It had a from dusk till dawn feeling to it. Yeah, you know, with the supernatural elements. Just, yeah, just but but just crazy action violence. Um, you know, it wasn't. Again, I just. Uh, it was stylistically impressive. Yeah. Yeah, the the editing, the way some of the uh, 3D is presented in the film with the car, uh, you know, jumping over people. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, of course, what's also amazing in these shots is the carelessness with which they dispatch human bodies. Oh yeah, <laughs> all over the place. Well, um, there's one, um, there's one particularly graphic killing of a uh, of someone, and they're like kneeling on the on the road firing a gun at Nicolas Cage. Oh, that was good. And the camera pulls back, and I'm like, I know it's going to happen. But when it does, you kind of like, wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, I, was, that was incredibly nasty. Well, you know, they, they also, uh, it, they played, it had continuity. Because when they showed that car again, you saw the blood splatter yeah. all the way up the hood. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, so um, kudos to them for the little touch like that. Something in the, when you were, just for a continuity uh -huh. thing, when you were reading the thing from Summit, the PR, did they, just, they say her boyfriend's cherry red muscle car? 
Well, yeah, because you remember uh, David Morse also appears in the film. Right, and Each right, of these characters Bert, seems human, but uh, the, the main characters are, are connected to a, um, you know, sort of a, an eternal supernatural element. Mm -hmm. You know, they may be playing a truck driver or a tow truck guy or, uh, you know, Nicolas Cage, the renegade, renegade runaway, but um, they, they carry with them a, the knowledge of the thousands of years that they've been alive. Right. And they, and they right. have that shared knowledge in what they're doing. Um, no, my only point was that her boyfriend, the first muscle car, is a blue um, right, but if you car. recall, but then later she gets David um, mm -hmm. David Morris gives her a red car. But right, just magically happens to be. Uh, but you know, one can make the point that you know that because he has these cars under tarps in his garage, that he's been preparing for the day that he'd be able to see his know, dead friend show up with a hot give, blonde yeah. and <laughs> to, do, to you know service somebody in this way. I suppose. Hmm. Um, terrific film. I kind of liked it in the way that I liked uh, Piranha 3D. Oh, I would. You know? I would go see this again. John, I thought this was. I'm thinking this is going to make your ten best list for next year. Well, you know, it's early. It's still <laughs> early, and um, it it wasn't. No, it it was good. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot more fun than I thought it was going to be. Um, I don't think it's. It didn't wow me like Piranha 3D. Well, it was cool. You know, I mean, I really I uh, I dig the cars. The 68 oh, yeah. Dodge Charger, very cool. How can it not be? Isn't it? Isn't the Dodge Charger the also the same car that we used in was used in Death Proof? Pro, they look some similar. Mm. It's one of those iconic things. But do you think it needed to be in 3D? Uh, so did the 3D work all the time for you? Um, no. no. Yeah, there were times when, like, when he's holding the, the God Killer, this big antique. Yeah, it's a, it's a particular gun. You cannot apparently in this world. You know, obviously they can't be killed by, by by human means, but there is a gun from hell called the God Killer that, loaded with the right bullet, can cause the eternal extinction of the accountant mm -hmm. or or other people who happen to be from that. That is that zip code? <laughs> <laughs> from that. Yeah. So, um, but there were times like when when Nicholas Cage is pointing the. Um, the God Killer at the camera, mm -hmm. you know, for that for that pop off the screen effect, it was out of focus for me, you know. And I was like, move my head, trying to adjust it. Again, you know, it was fun. Some of the stuff was fun in 3D, and I'll always be a big fan of nudity in 3D. But did it need to be in 3D? Not really. I think it was it entertaining. Just as, I mean, it was. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was. But I think it was it just in, But most just of the stuff that's flying at you is like the 3D that we've seen in other films, you yeah. know, like axe, body parts, bullets. Yeah. Car parts. I'm sure when I get this on DVD, so and I cool. will buy it when it's on DVD. Well, you'll notice that, that it's the posters are Drive Angry 3D, yeah. but in the film, each time the title appears, it's just Drive Angry. Right. They just make a big point of saying this was shot in 3D, so we don't think it's like the Clash of the Titan quick fix at the very end to make it look like it has a 3D feel to it. It looked really good. I mean, I yeah. thought there was some fuzziness to it, but I'm not ascribing that to the actual filming of this film no, because sure was the we watched it at Boston Common, so here in Boston, and the theater has consistently shown these types of movies incorrectly. So I'm assuming that although we saw something that looked really good, it did occur to me that they may have been showing it through the wrong lens again. And uh, I can never tell. It was not. Shit. It was not as bright as I thought it should be. Yeah. But um, well, we're, yeah. we're inside wearing dark glasses. So, but anyway, all in all, fun, much more fun than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, I will be Great way to spend my, my uh, Friday afternoon. Yeah, I will highly recommend it. Would you say the same thing about uh, Hall Pass? No. The new Fairly Brothers film? No, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> I think you mentioned to me earlier in the week that you really did not enjoy it. Yeah. And so I had a very low expectation, and I thought there were some big laughs. Yep. You know? There were some, you know, my... Do you have a write-up for that, a synopsis? I do. Rick, played by Owen Wilson, and Fred, played by Jason Sudeikis, are best friends who have a lot in common, including the fact that they have each been married for many years. But when the two men begin to show signs of restlessness at home, their wives, played by Jana Fisher and Christina Applegate, take a bold approach to revitalizing their individual marriages, granting them a hall pass, one week of freedom to do whatever they want, no questions asked. At first, it sounds like a dream come true for Rick and Fred, but it isn't long before they discover that their expectations are out of sync with reality. Entertaining? Moments. Moments, if it were. <laughs> yeah. um, here's, here's my problem, is that the Ferrelli brothers make 
two movies. They make their gross-out comedy, and they make their romantic comedy. This is the gross-out comedy. they jam them together. I like the romantic comedy part of this, but I didn't need the gross-out comedy. You know? They can't seem to... There are a couple of scenes in this movie incredibly funny, but incredibly gross. And it kind of makes me wonder what Dylan Wilson was thinking by agreeing to be in this film. Him? I'm what about the Irish guy? guy. Or, holy <laughs> crap. <laughs> Who? And I do mean crap. Yeah, yeah. This, um, you know, we, we touched upon this before, but there seems to be a, uh, a theme running through a lot of movies lately about married couples giving each other a hall pass. Yeah. There was the um, uh, No Strings Attached. Right. And there was... Um, the Natalie Portman flick. Yep. There's just been a couple of them. There seems to be this, you know, this theme about... And, you know, they're all the same. That It seems like a good idea. And then, oh, there'll be consequences. So it seems like a good idea to these guys until their wives decide they have a hall pass, too. And that's where I think the film gets interesting, is that the wives go off and have their hall pass while the guys have theirs. They didn't really sell that, but I noticed that after seeing the movie, there was a poster with Jana Fisher holding her hall pass card. Yeah, yeah. So we think it's all, as far as the trailer is concerned, we think it's about the guys getting a free pass. But right. there's, the girls also get the free right. pass. Right, and that's where I think the story's interesting. So you wonder who's going to cheat on each other. Right, and, and I like the way it played out. But again, I don't need to see shit jokes and dick jokes well that's what and you're getting with a Fairly Brothers movie they, yeah. they do toilet humor, humor. but it doesn't it doesn't fit it doesn't fit with the rest of the story for me you know um, well it's intended to shock it's made the millions I know but when was um, Fever Pitch they didn't uh, they didn't use it no I think I would say Fever Pitch is probably the one where they had the least yeah, any, uh, toilet humor. It just didn't work for that. But then again, they were adapting uh, Nick Hornby's book. Yeah, you can't really put so jokes in really Nick Hornby's that. stuff, right? Um, <laughs> the Heartbreak Break Kid had some gross-out stuff. I didn't watch um, that. I just wouldn't. The Shallow original? Hal certainly did. But, um, you know, the, the Fairley Brothers, they make some quality films, but the problem is, is that they're not, they're still riding on the success of... There's yeah. something about Mary. Well, initially Dumb and Dumber, but when something about Mary is what really would put them over the top. But, mm -hmm. you know, Kingpin was a failure. And, uh, I love uh, Kingpin. Me, myself, and Irene, <laughs> definitely a failure. Shallow House, Stuck on You, failure, failure. I love uh, <laughs> The Ringer, failure. Uh, but Fever Pitch was, I believe, a success. Yeah. And um, Heartbreak Kid, to me, came and went without notice. Yeah. I mean, I saw it maybe a year later on video and thought it was amusing. Was Did you ever see the original with Charles Grodin and Sibley Shepard? No. That's that's a classic. But, um, um, you know, I just, I like the performances. You know, I thought Owen Wilson and uh, there are scenes like, there's a scene where it's just, uh, is it Jason Sudeikis? Sudeikis, yeah. And Owen Wilson, they're just, they, they get alone, they go to visit a rich friend's house, mm -hmm. and while everyone else takes a tour of the panic room, they're, that they're is stuck the funniest in the, scene in the movie. The, they're stuck in the, in the bar of the house, and they're talking like guys. It's just, it's, it's, an, it's, it's very funny, it's well written, it's very natural, and they get caught doing it, which is kind of funny. But that's, you know, so there were scenes in the movie, again, that I liked, um, and I liked Jenna Fisher and Christina Applegate. Yeah, they were you know, very good. Um, they were probably some of the best female characters the Ferrelli brothers have done. Yeah. You know, and they, they give them a, enough, not, I wish there was more of it, but they give them a good amount of screen time to, to, um, to have good, you know, to make good characters and have their own part of the movie. Uh, like I said, it was my favorite part of the movie. It was what they do, what they go through. Well, it, the setup here is that um, Jason Sudeikis and Owen Wilson hang out with this, uh, their characters hang out with this, uh, their card group, who are a bunch of yeah. gung-ho guys that basically talk about the different ways, and, and, you know, hitting and nailing on women, you know, nailing women. Yeah, if only hitting they were married, women. you know, they'd be living the you have no life. Right, and, you know, their <laughs> wives, both of them were at times taken aback by their ogling of other women. Yeah. And, and not even taking care to hide it. You know, it's just out in the open. So a couple of things happen after that that make Jana Fisher decide to say, you know, this idea of you're giving, a husband, you're giving your husband a hall, hall pass maybe isn't uh, such a bad idea. You yeah. know, because by being married, they're wanting what they now can't have. Mm -hmm. And with the hall pass, you'd think that that would change even though they've been given a week you know, of being able to uh, 
you know, do whatever they want. I, I did find it funny that they had to, because of that moment where they were um, speaking their minds at the bar while the other guys were watching them in the panic room, and it was really hysterical, Owen Wilson's punishment is the hall pass. Right, right. Uh, Jason Sudeikis has a very, actually, I thought was a really funny moment where he did his wife wrong so horribly that she gave him a hall pass. Mm -hmm. It's like, basically, it's not that... You know, we know that you need help. We actually need a vacation from you, is what the wives are saying. Right. So the way the hall pass thing plays out is they count their days, and they, by the time they get to the second day and the third day, they're trying to wean themselves off of being the stay-at-home type of really ultra-normal, no-problems dads that they are. Yeah. So yeah. It, it takes some days to unwind, to, to get out of the habit of, uh, you know, going to Applebee's or <laughs> Chili's and eating, uh, you know, until they get Eve's sick money, and then yeah, falling asleep at 9 o'clock. Yeah. You know? Yeah, they were real, um, real studs out so there. So they had to... You know, they had to break the habit. Uh, but so when it gets into be about the fourth day, uh, Owen Wilson meets a very hot Australian barista uh, that is surprisingly single, but for the purposes of the movie, it works, and uh, strikes up a relationship with her. Mm -hmm. So he decides to, oh, and instead of just being able to go after any woman, which they, they, they all believe that they can just name right, any woman, right. but they obviously can't. But he does strike up a relationship with her and so you think that they're going to be getting together mm -hmm. but there's this subplot with the other barista guy yeah. uh, this guy played by uh, Derek Wal Waters plays Brent mm -hmm. who turns out to be kind of a psycho that works pretty well for the film as in he's just out to you know to get he's obsessed by her yeah he's obsessed yeah. by her because she's just so beautiful and he's uh, jealous of uh, Owen Wilson's character so he works his way into the uh, proceedings in a pretty amusing way mm -hmm. um, and she was good the Australian girl Nikki Whalen you know she was very a little, hot a little, yeah. exceptionally hot yeah she would look good in 3D yeah <laughs> look good in 2D yeah. but she's also they give she's a, she seemed to be a good enough actress I don't think I've seen her in much else but she, she was more than just a dumb blonde. Mm -hmm. um, so, but again, you know, every time I started to get interested in the characters, they'd be a shit show. Well, that's what the Fairly Brothers yeah. did. There's, I, I would say there's three moments in this movie that kind of make you go, whoa, that was crazy. There's one moment with Jason Sudeikis and a 20-something college girl in a hotel room mm -hmm. that is just... The thong girl? Oh, my God, the thong girl. With the, the upset thong girl, stomach? Yes, with the upset stomach. Mm. That was... <laughs> Again, I'm not denying I laughed, but I mean, man, was that gross. Yeah. Oh, my God. Okay, you know, and there's a, there's a scene where... Um, Another one in the Wilson gets yeah. caught in a hot... Or passes out in a hot tub <laughs> and is rescued by two naked men. And they put it all on screen. Yeah, for a long time. Yeah. But, you know, I think the movie also suffers by this minor fact that it tends to apologize for itself. Yeah. Because the characters uh, that Jason Sudeikis and Owen Wilson play are super nice guys that are all talk. And when they do confront being able to get what they want, they end up profusely apologetic mm -hmm. for just being in the situation. Right. Although Jason Sudeikis is pretty funny in the way he does actually go ahead with stuff. But he, you know, he, he has, his character has a way of convincing himself that he did and he didn't. Right. So he's got, like, an out. Mm -hmm. But um, the movie just seemed, seemed itself to be overly apologetic for what it was doing. Yeah. And I think Owen Wilson was entertaining, but I'm kind of virgin on the idea here that he wasn't particularly well cast. No. You know, because no. I just don't see him as a dad. I see him more as the wedding crashers guy. I just kind of didn't see him in the character. No, he doesn't. He doesn't work. You know, they make him play with the kids, but he's just you know, um, he's not very believable. And he's also a one-note guy through the whole thing. Very much. You know? his character really doesn't have. The, I think neither neither of the guys have an arc here. No, I think the, the did. character that characters that really swing it around are uh, Jana Fisher and uh, Christina Applegate. Yeah, yeah, they give especially full... Jana Fisher. Yeah, they give full performances here, mm -hmm. um, and because you get to see them as the they're the housewives, and then they're all they're it, they're really good together, you know. When um, 
again, like when Owen Wilson and Jason have their their scene together in the bar when they get caught on camera, that's a good scene. It's fresh. Christina and um, Jaina have a lot of scenes like that where they just mm -hmm. talking with each other, and then then they go off and have their own adventures on their hall passes. And I right, again, right, and they deal with the consequences of those too. Well, I think specifically Jaina Fisher because she's the one who instigates the idea of the hall pass, mm -hmm. but also realizes in some ways her error by doing so is the one who has the real um, the trial of conscience, mm -hmm. the, the real, um, the one who's sort of learned from her mistake. Mm -hmm. and I don't really think that Owen Wilson um, in any way changed. They go, they they do have quote unquote like an adventure with a wild card chase and right, some right. screwy things happening with the police chasing him. But they're just like a couple of kids that are trying to get out of trouble. Yeah, it's the women yeah. who are actually more mature in the film. Mm -hmm. uh, it could have been both ways. The women, the women do have their catty moments. Yeah, you know where they get themselves into trouble momentarily, I suppose. But it's nothing compared to the guys, and the guys are, you know, they were the ones apparently who needed to be reined in and didn't learn as much. And, right, and uh, because they, because Owen Wilson gives such a one note performance, you don't believe his lesson at the end. There's also this other larger issue of like having done something during this hall pass, would you be able to trust your wife or husband after this? No. I and mean, there's yeah. something always unbelievable about the, the idea that, okay, you can go off and do what you want and there'll be no consequences. You know, just come back and everything will be just the way it was. And that in left. itself is based on a trust, but it's not actually going to fly. Because right. even if they do the hall pass and they commit the, the things that they wanted to do, it's going to come back to get them in oh, the future. Yeah. Even though Maggie and Rick say to themselves before this happens that there will be no consequences. That's still a statement that's taking place in that time. That's not going to translate into nobody's going to bring this up ten years from now. Right. Or, or ten minutes after he gets back. Yep. You know, no. this is just just like in, um, uh, what was the Natalie Portman flip? You know, it's this a recipe. Yeah, it's, this is a recipe for disaster. Sure. You know, sure. It, it, because trust is a major issue. It's the main thing in relationships. Mm -hmm. You violate that, you create a, even a little bit of mistrust. It's, you know, it's a problem. You know, so they liked the idea of it. The practice of it was entirely different. Um, the movie, I thought, had some really funny moments. Uh, the gross-out stuff. <laughs> that's what's going to sell the film. That's what's going to sell. Yeah, yeah, and that's you know, if 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 you come out of a movie like this, and all you're going to talk about is the woman in the thong scene. <laughs> There's something wrong there. I'm laughing about it. They, you know, yeah, they, they did what they were supposed to do, you man. They got the laugh. No, they need to just grow up. And again, they could have made, they could have stopped that scene before they take it to the other step. They could have stopped <laughs> the scene before they have, you know, the dick jokes. Yeah. The end. Yeah. It, um, it's. I don't, I don't think it's a success for the. Uh, no. I, I don't think it's a success for the Fairley Brothers. I think it's running. At, last I saw on Rotten Tomatoes the other day, it was at 30 percent. Uh, the pre-release reviews, so no. not looking good for them. It's funny, they're still capable of some really funny stuff, but not consistently. And now they're going to make the Three Stooges movie. Oh yeah, you talked to them about it. Yeah. Tell me. Um, they're going to start April 18th. They wouldn't tell me who they'd cast as any of the Stooges or anything in the movie, but they did tell me a joke, a hmm. gag from the movie, where the Stooges, it's not a biopic, it's going to be three little Three Stooges movies, like you see when you watch the Stooges on TV. Right. So it'll be three movies, each about a half hour long, and they'll be tied together somehow so it comes across as a big movie. But one of the jokes is the the Stooges are, are going down the road in a cart pulled by poodles. <laughs> and they crash. And Mo gets up and slaps Larry, because Larry was driving, and he goes, don't you know how to drive a cart? And Larry goes, I don't know, Mo, what kind of poodles are they? And Mo says, standard. And Larry says, I can't drive standard. <laughs> That's the joke. Great. So if it's a movie like that, if it's like Dumb and Dumber, where there is no redeeming value at whatsoever except for being stupid, I'm going for They it. maybe need to get back to that. You know, I think so. I think when they, when, they, when they admit there's no redeeming value here except for being dumb, they're great at that. But here they're playing with more mature things. Relationships, you know, they they talked in the interview about how they they their main influence is the Andy Griffith show. You know, well, John, yeah, so. I think that the point you made about them making two different types of movies mm -hmm. actually the two different types of movies put together don't equate because you have a very right. heavy ha family element here, like 
three quarters of this movie could be a family film. I don't know family, but it could be a night. It could be a PG thirteen romantic comedy. Yeah, um, that, that's a better way to put it. Which would be fine. But then you get the the twenty five percent. That's just there's no way that this can pass for any sort of. Big, but big these big other, these other moments just take oh. it over the top into uh, college humor type of stuff. So I would not recommend this, obviously. <laughs> I just, yeah, I can't say pay ten bucks for it. I wouldn't no. do it. It's it's video. If you're gonna pay ten, twelve bucks, go see Drive Angry. Yeah. Seriously, that's the one. All right. Moving on, John. Pitch of the week. Yes. What have we got? I um, I saw the sweet sweet smell of success, which stars on uh, Tony Curtis and Burt Lancaster. It's an amazing movie. It's just amazing. Burt Lancaster plays a Broadway columnist, kind of like um. Uh, who's the famous columnist on Broadway? Walter Winchell. Mm -hmm. One of those guys where, you know, his name, your name in his column can make you a star. If he badmouths you in his column, your, your career is over. He's this big, powerful guy. He spends, it's, it's so beautiful. He's shot in black and white in New York City in 1957. So huh. they go to, like, Two Shores. They go to Club 21. They go to all these famous New York hangouts. And this guy sets up his booth, you know, and everyone comes to him. You know, and tries to give him tips and, you know, get, you know, buddy up to him and tell him this news or gossip. And then Tony Curtis plays this guy named Sidney, who is a PR agent, like a low life PR agent, who's desperate to get on Burt Lancaster's good side. But Burt Lancaster is blackballing Sidney because his, his sister is dating a jazz musician. And he wants Sidney to break up the relationship, and Sidney hasn't done it yet. So Burt Lancaster, the columnist, is blackballing Sidney. He won't put any of his items in. Huh. It's the, it's just, it's got the Clifford Odette wrote the screenplay. It's got the snappiest dialogue. Um, it's, it's down and dirty stuff. Did this just come out on Criterion? Yeah, yeah. And the, that's the thing in the Criterion collection, you get. Um, you know, a great a great reproduction of this classic movie. But then you get like a a fifty page book inside about you know the screenplay, the huh. times, what Winchell was really like. Man, that's what's you that's what's these, the best about Criterion. This is like a, this is like a study terrific guide. supplemental yeah, stuff. This is a great you know, study guide for a movie. You can just you know you can watch the movie and be blown away. But then you can mm -hmm. watch it with all this extra material and find out, you know, just how important it was to their careers, what it meant at the time when it came out, um, the power of the columnist. Yeah, the context know. of it. Yeah, the Criterion whole context so of, this, of, this, of this event. So it's definitely, um, I, you know, it's more than 50 years old, and it snaps. It just snaps so well. I just, you know... Um, yeah, it's just a, it's a treat. Man, I'd love to see it. I'd love to see it. I think I'm going to rent it. I'll pass it on. I'll Thanks. pass it on. You want the whole study kit. <laughs> All right. Cool, cool. Thanks. Hey, um, you know what I did? I, um, uh, I actually initially wanted to propose that we do at least half a show talking about Peter Yates, but we couldn't get things together quickly enough to do that. And the main reason is, is because uh, the Brattle Theater in Cambridge is going to do a couple of days, uh, uh, show a couple of thumb. Um, Yates' films. Um, mm -hmm. He passed away back in January. Um, they're going to show Bullet and uh, Robbery, which I think was a 1967 film he made in England prior to uh, Bullet, which got him the job on Bullet because McQueen loved the car chase, the Jaguar oh, okay. car chase in the film, which you can actually see on YouTube. And I tried to rent it, and um, that couldn't happen. And uh, so I looked it up at the Brattle again, and... and I'm sure as hell the movie is not available on home video. I think it is now available on home video in Region 2, but um, the only way to see this movie is if you were able to get one of the 20-year-old VHS cassettes <laughs> or, what go, Dad? What are or go see it at the Brattle this week. I don't remember the exact date. I think it was the second, March 2nd or 3rd. Um, Brattlefilm.org, is it? Yeah, Brattlefilm.org. And they're going to show it twice and on that and day. And you get to go see Bullet on the big screen, which is a treat. Yeah. Well, they're showing Bullet on on the second and third, I believe, twice. And uh, that I've never seen on the big screen. I would love to. You want to hear my Bullet story? Go for it. Um, this is when I'm a kid. When did it come out? Bullet came out in 60... 68, I believe. 68. So I'm like 9 or 10 years old. My dad takes me to a double feature of Bullet and Bonnie and Clyde. Nice. So, you remember Bonnie and Clyde, right? Oh, sure. Yeah. When Estelle Parsons gets shot in the eye, mm -hmm. and she reaches up, and, what happened to my eye? See, right. I remember this vividly. 
I got so nauseous, I ran into the bathroom. It just freaked me out. I come out of the bathroom, Bonnie and Clyde are getting killed. Back into the bathroom. Great. My dad comes and gets me in intermission. What's the matter with you? Uh, Okay, can we go sit down? Bullet. What's the first thing that happens? Some guy gets blown in half by a shotgun. Thrown into the into the wall. Yeah, yeah, he's standing on the bed, shotgun, boom, up against the wall. Now, when you see it today, it's, it's kind of like, funny because yeah. it's like red paint comes out of him. Right. But at the time, boom, right back in the bathroom. So I came out and I saw the car chase, and then I loved bullets. Or even at the, at the end, you know, when the guy gets shot through the glass oh, at the yeah. airport and falls onto the glass. That was pretty extreme in 68. Yeah. Yeah. And Imagine if you're 10 years old. And Bonnie and Clyde was the height of violence. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Bonnie and Clyde's um, still pretty violent. You know, and, and a lot of people talk about the car chase in, uh, in Bullet, and it really, it just, it turns the stomach unlike other things. Unlike other car chases today, they're so based on like the ones that we just saw. They're so based on effects and, uh, yeah, and editing and, and crazy things else, going yeah. on. And you, there's a lot of simple stuff happening in Bullet, but it still has this uh, moving, your seat, moving yeah. effect. Yeah. Uh, the the chase scene in the robbery, uh, which I saw, which was quite amazing, mm-hmm. actually. Uh, the, the speeds with which these um, Jaguars were going was uh, pretty impressive. Um, so what you know, what I wanted to do was uh, take a look at a bunch of uh, Peter Yates's other films and uh, and pick a few out of his um, filmography that I thought I did are too. definitely worth it. And I, we both love um, Friends of Eddie Coyle. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think it was Especially just... if you're from Boston yeah. and you get to see what Boston looked like in 1973. 73. I mean, it's a great story anyway, but when they go to the garden to watch the, the Bruins play, it's the old garden. They yep. drive down the streets. There's, you know, they, that bar he goes to is no longer there. You know, it's just a great time capsule of Boston in that time period. Yeah, it is. What I always thought was the Tower Records location was mm-hmm. actually the bar where Eddie goes to get his info to make his mm-hmm. connections. You know, he's yeah. a gun runner. And I also really dig the scenes along the Charles where he sells guns to this uh, college couple. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that's neat to see. The few movies that were filmed in Boston around um, 72, 73, there were. There was The Paper Chase. There was a Love Story. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, in the in the Cambridge area, right, right. So that you know is always neat to see. Great performance by Robert Mitchum and Peter Boyle. Yeah, you know, yeah. Who maybe you'd only know from that. You know, everyone loves Raymond Kraft. Yeah. Peter Boyle was a, is yeah, a great was actor. A lot of presence, and right? He was he was great in this movie. Was good action stuff, but yeah, it didn't, great didn't, setting. Didn't Peter Yates do a commentary on the DVD? I don't know. Um, I oh, so that's right. I'm sorry, I forgot. You don't listen to commentaries. No. Uh, yeah, there's that. <laughs> they they there's talk that about, uh, they have some great <laughs> yeah. behind the scenes photo stuff with um, Robert Mitchum and whatnot, and the other, uh, I think Peter Boyle too, filming in um, uh, on Boston Common, which is basically just right across the street from where we are right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the period stuff was really neat. That's a good um, They even have a, uh, on the DVD, they had a um, the, the alternate ending. Sort of the scene where um, Robert Mitchum gets shot in the cab, and they actually have a dummy head that looked so much not like him that they had to cut it out. But they have the actual huh. the footage from that. Uh, I believe on the DVD. You know, maybe I'm remembering this incorrectly. It was either the footage or photos of the of the scene or something. But anyway, that's one to recommend. What else? Oh, sure. Criterion does it very well. Again, the other one I picked was uh, a 1969 film. His film that he directed after Bullet, called uh, John and Mary, Mm -hmm. starring Dustin Hoffman and Mia Farrow. Well, here, let me read the summary. John and Mary begins in the morning after John and Mary meet in a bar during a conversation about Jean-Luc Godard's weekend, and they go home together. The story unfolds during the day as they belatedly get to know each other over breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Flashbacks of their previous bad relationships are interspersed throughout when something in their conversation brings them up. It's really interesting because Mm -hmm. these flashbacks aren't reality. So the movie begins with um, Dustin and Hoffman and Mia Farrow getting out of bed, and the whole day is their conversation. And the fact that they neither, both of them don't learn each other's names. They're trying to 
like get into each other's heads psychologically. So right. when Dustin Hoffman starts talking about his ex-girlfriend, uh, Mia Farrow gets these images of, oh my God, she's this incredible model and jet setting and right, these right. fancy things. So you get this heightened reality. And the same thing happens when um, Mia Farrow describes her life to John. So when she's describing where she lives, you know, on a tree-lined street with a bunch of men who live on the street who own poodles, and <laughs> it's a relatively safe place, but there's only two stabbings a week. I mean, so he, yeah, it's, it was, it was it's actually funny seeing Mia Farrow walk down the street with these guys uh, uh, walking poodles and then stepping over a body with a knife in its back as she gets up to her apartment. <laughs> and she talks about living in her apartment with a filmmaker downstairs who's documenting everybody's lives and it has some strange anachronistic things in that she says that all the Japanese guys who live in the apartment downstairs only do computer dating. Uh, I, I, I mean, computer dating in 1969? Sure. I was like... Wow. They dated actual computers. It wasn't the fine women. They actually dated computers back then. And so a lot of the film is, is done through memory and voiceover. And so when they're relating to each other, you're hearing Dustin Hoffman's internal conversation responding to what she's saying, you know, with their background and beliefs and stories and mm -hmm. whatnot. So... It was a very quiet film. Right. I had to watch it with the subtitles on. The sound mix was very, very low. Right. Uh, but I thought it was really neatly done, because Justin Hoffman, he plays a, a furniture designer, and his, his apartment, where most of the movie takes place, is quite cool. It's quite, like, at that time, ultra-modern. So she doesn't know whether to be impressed by it or put off by it. Right, And right. everybody's assumption. And he doesn't know whether, like, is she, since they meet in a bar, uh, and, and we get to, you know, through flashbacks, see their meeting in the bar, his assumptions about her, like, is she somebody that goes to bars every night? And so you learn the whole story as to, like, why she was actually there and how they met. And they're completely compatible mm -hmm. with each other. It's not like they... They're, they're, like, they're trying to build trust in so the midst of two hours. <laughs> no, they're, they're, they're actually... It's, it's a pleasant film. It's not for everyone, though. It's, it's got sort of a European sensibility in terms of it's like um, very quiet, right. composed. Uh, the, the camera angles are, are, I think, really telling because often you see Dustin Hoffman in his apartment, but he's surrounded by the angles and curves and designs of his things. So he seems like somebody who's owned by his stuff or trapped mm -hmm. by his apartment and doesn't really get out. They're both introverts. Like, she's not a partier. Right, and it's sort of exemplified in the way she responds to things by um, when she gets asked out by other guys, or she's actually what we um, learn about her is that she is a mistress. She works in an art gallery, but she's also a mistress, mistress to this guy who's like a, a jet set and you know Mr. Moneybags. Right. Um, so she's morally questionable. She's also very frail. You know, they, they each have these singular. A couple of elements about them. You're not sure if you can totally trust them, but they're they're right for each other. I don't think mm -hmm. at any point I thought that they they weren't going to get together. You know, it was going to work. But it's an interesting slice of late '60s New York, but with all the po uh, political unrest that was going on at the time. Well, I'm all curious. Well, um, I saw this on Netflix, and it said it was a controversial film. Any sense of why it would be controversial? Uh, it was it was frank discussion about. Uh, women's sexuality uh -huh. and prior to that it was as though possibly Hollywood prior to not prior to that but maybe prior to 1960 it was as though women didn't want sex right, right but she's sort of sexually aggressive in the film and openly talks about it but then there, there's also the politics they attend uh, a speech by a local politician wherein the issues of the time are all brought up and I think both of them are kind of like red diaper babies their parents were you know active in you know, raising money for, you know, certain organizations right. and protesting and things like that. So it's I've these never heard things that, that term sort of a red diaper baby. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it's what happens when they get together. You know, the, the all the things that uh, you know, the new women's live. Is she about that or not about that? Right. Um, is he assumed to, to be some sort of lecherous guy, or is he truly a, a nice guy, or too good to be true? I think they both thought. How's Austin's acting? Be true. 
Was this still early in his career before he became Dustin Hoffman? Yeah, yeah. It, um, yeah. Well, it's after um, a couple years after the graduate, but, but still, uh, he terrific. Gotten... I like the whole New York ambiance. Yeah. You know, he has a really neat apartment, and <laughs> there's just something about the, the, the exteriors of New York at that time. And, sure. Uh, like and watching... Tyne Daly is in the film. She plays Mia Farrell's girlfriend, roommate. Kind of. Yeah, so that was, I didn't get, she looked so much to me not, I, I was not on the lookout for anything like this, but just so not like Cagney and Lacey. Yeah. Just well, what was the, out she, there. Was in that, uh, she was in a Dirty Harry movie too. Now, the movie had a lot of style. It was really, um, uh, is there anything else on the list? Well, I, I want to say that his, you know, after doing Bullet, doing something like this was kind of, you know, it showed that he has this real control of characters, yeah. and you know, it's it's a lot. It's it's like face. It's basically, this is the kind of movie where um, so much of the character that we're getting to know is played out through faces, and it kind of makes me wonder whether he was watching a Cassavetes film, right? You know, right. or or been influenced by that. I enjoyed it. It's not for everyone, but I give it a um, shot. I thought it was worth it, so I do recommend it. All right. And I think we're good. Yes. And I think that great. wraps it up for this week. So um, check us out online. We're at post-movie.net. All of our shows are up there. We're also on iTunes. Definitely subscribe. We'd love that. We always love the downloads. Every, we love every download we get. And we All also love if we, <laughs> if we can get even a single review on iTunes, we'd be so grateful. Right. We'll email you back thank yous. <laughs> that, would be, that would be terrific. So, um, and we're on, we're on Facebook, too. We have a number of fans there, so check us out. I'm always, like, amazed to think that, like, we started out with, like, ten, but now it's up to <laughs> 550 or so. Cool. Yeah. You know, and it's not all family. It's actual people who like what yeah. we do. Yeah. It's always I fun. hope. Yeah. I hope. Yeah. You know, I maybe the people who don't like what they do don't communicate yeah. with us. But we got a good, a fair number of likes, so yeah. it's good stuff. And if you get the chance, send us an email. We're at contact at post-movie.net, and we're also at postmoviepodcast at gmail.com. Either of those emails gets you to the right place. So until next week, I'm Steve Head. I'm John Black. So long, everyone. <laughs>